Um, but Yale Roosevelt, on the, on the recommendation of uh, Harvard, then Harvard law professor and soon to be Supreme Court Justice Frank, uh, uh, Felix Frankfurter, had asked the nation editor, Ernest Gruning, uh, to accompany Cordell Hall as a kind of unofficial advisor. Gruning is, becomes well known much later in, in, as a senator from Alaska. He would become famous for casting the one, only one of two votes against the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. But already in the 1920s, as an editor for the nation, or a writer for the nation, he was a committed anti-imperialist. Um, in the pages of the magazine, he helped expose the, the use of torture in, 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 in Haiti in the Dominican Republic, forced labor, political assassinations that took place under marine occupation in the Caribbean, atrocities he likened to European brutality in India, Ireland, and the Congo. Uh, after touring Haiti and the Dominican Republic, he lobbied Congress to cut off the funding of counterinsurgency operations in the region. And he excoriated what he quote, what he wrote in the pages of the nation as quote, the horde of carpet bagging concessionaries that are the camp followers of American militaristic imperialism. It's kind of amazing, and I think it gives you a sense of the openness of the political moment that, that I mean, it would be like, I mean, I made this joke before, but it would be like, you know, it would be like as if, um, Barack Obama asked Katrina to go company, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton on, 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 a, on a major, on a major uh, diplomatic mission, or Amy Goodman. Yeah. You know, uh, Hull opposed, I can't go into all the details, but Hull was quite, Hull was a Tennessee gentry, he had fought in, 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 in the liberation of Cuba. Uh, he, he was a free trader. He was opposed to, uh, he was opposed to, to, to making the concession of non-intervention. Latin America, but Gruning pushed him, and pushed him quite effectively. Uh, it's fun to read Gruning's memoir. Uh, he portrays, he really captures the, the drawl, the kind of Tennessee drawl, the stuttering drawl, you know, uh, of Hull that I, I can't really imitate. But, you know, what am I going to do when, when chaos breaks out in one of those countries and armed bands go roaming and around burden and pillaging and murdering Americans? Hull asks, how am I going to tell my people that we can't intervene? And according to Gruning, at least, that he answered with this, I think it's the kind of foundational premise of anti-imperialism. He said, uh, you know, Mr. Secretary, that usually happens after we intervene. <laughs> um, and Hull conceded for a lot of different reasons. I don't want to, I'm not going to, you know, obviously it's not all because of Gruning, but Gruning played a, 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 a significant role in, 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 in having Hull sign on to non-intervention. And this, I, I can't overestimate uh, the effect that this had on international law. Again, I've made this argument elsewhere, but um, you know, it was it was uh, the first significant foreign policy uh, success of FDR. When FDR first talked about the Good Neighbor Policy in his inaugural address, he didn't mention Latin America. It was a paragraph about what he wanted to do with foreign policy, but he really didn't have the ambition outstripped the means. Uh, you know, the militarists and colonialists, and, and, and in Europe and Asia. And, and Latin America was really the place, and, and so increasingly, what that vision of a good neighbor policy based on non-aggression and anti-militarism, a lot of which he actually, which I won't go into, he played, you know, plagiarizes from, from Argentina, um, is applied in Latin America to enormous success. Uh, it, um, FDR pulls the Marines out of Haiti, he abrogates the Plata Amendment in Cuba, he accepts a, a significant degree of economic nationalism in Latin America, including the, the nationalization of oil in Mexico, uh, improved relations with, with Latin America, helps the U.S. recover from the Great Depression, uh, the Asia off limits and Europe headed for war, Washington looks south both for markets uh, and for resources, uh, negotiating trade treaties, negotiating trade treaties from one country after another, and this is where Cordell Hall comes in. More importantly, Latin America becomes the foundation of multilateralism. Uh, Sumner Wells, the Secretary of State for Latin America, he played a, a significant role in the United Nations, a lot of Declaration of Human Rights, which were adopted by Latin American countries, works its way into the UN Declaration of Human Rights. It's this, it's the UN, rather than weakening US power, it, it strengthens it, it provides a framework for the US to project soft power. Uh, in all sorts of ways, and it becomes the model for the liberal multinational order. Um, I just want to come back now and taking that as a baseline, the role played by the anti-imperialism and grooming of, in, in, in shaping the multilateral order for good or bad, liberal multilateralism, uh, in, in creating the kind of Keynesian 
liberal, multilateral foundation, a framework that becomes the foundation of the interstate system after, after World War II, as the baseline for thinking, going back and thinking about this diversion, divergence between the new republic and, and, and the nation. On the one hand, uh, the new republic, for many different reasons, throws in with undermining disorder. And Nicaragua supports the Contras. Uh, Fred Bonds was writing these, you know, Contra for a day. He could go down on, on, on military arranged junkets or report favorably on the, on the Contras. In El Salvador, the, the new republic accepted the administration's line in the 1980s of the violence that was conducted equally by the extremes on both sides. But more importantly, I think, um, and then of course in 1980, Robert Kagan and Charles Krauthammer, not just writing sketchily on any particular issue, really aggressively goes after the foundations of sovereignty, of, of multilateralism. And it's really the 1989 invasion of Panama, which I just wrote about recently in a piece that, that uh, you know, Nation Institute says the Tom Dispatch, uh, its 25th anniversary of Panama, becomes um, central in, in tossing out that framework and putting us in many ways on the road to Iraq. It's, it's the first unit, it comes a month after the, um, comes a month after the fall of the Berlin Wall. It's a year before the first Gulf War. It's done completely unilaterally. The OAS opposes it universally, except for the United States. The UN opposes it. Um, it is done in the name, not of national defense, but primarily, increasingly, democracy becomes the justification, works its way up the hierarchy of, of justification for that war. And it's shock and awe. It's, 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 it's done as a way, a spectacle. It's done as a way to overcome the Vietnam syndrome. And the New Republic is, is completely for that war. It, it, and not just um, not just in general contingently, but but goes after the United Nations and the Organization of American States for opposing it. Uh, the New Republic supported they're calling a credible and in the end unavoidable undertaking. Uh, the nation opposed it, uh, writing a series of extremely skeptical editorials. I don't know if it was Katrina or Victor, but they were on sign. The U.S. had said, "Is quote a country in search of enemies," and the Panama invasion is a major step forward. Cementing in place a new external demon, the Marco Traficante. Um, and again, that kind of skepticism, that sense, that understanding the, the nature of American militarism, that I think the nation doesn't lose over the course of, 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 of its long history for different reasons. When the New Republic complained about Carlos Fuentes' descent, Carlos Fuente, it called Carlos Fuentes. Uh, America's foremost resident denounces, you know, in that kind of snide way that the Republic perfected, that credentializing agency way, kind of way I talked about. The nation actually published when things to So, um, you know, I'll just wrap up by saying I think there's a lot of different reasons that I want to keep this short uh, and, and end it, but I think there's a lot of different reasons to account for why that anti-militarism doesn't extinguish in the nation. All of it had to do, I think, with what we just heard at Sarah the legacy of Frieda Kirchway uh, that rooted in a kind of anti-fascism and an understanding of fascism as, as a problem that doesn't get transmuted during the Cold War into, into anti-communism, understanding the nature of anti-communism domestically, the politics of it. Um, you know, but also, I just want to mention an historian, since this is the American Historical Association that, that Katrina mentioned. William Upham and William started writing for the nation prior to the publication of the tragedy, its most famous book, Tragedy of American Diplomacy, brought in by Harry McWilliams in the 1950s. And um, you know, it's, I, think, I think that it's kind of you know, impossible to uh, overstate his importance. I, I, I have a little bit here on, on some of his arguments, but I'm running out of time. But, um, but I think that, that, um, that Williams did for the nation pretty much what he did for American historiography, fortified the magazine's foreign policy skepticism with an attention to ideology, to psychology, to culture capable of withstanding those assaults uh, by Cold War liberals who charged that the magazine was too soft on, on, on communism. Um, you know, he, um, he, didn't, he wrote book reviews, he wrote essays, he wrote a very long piece in 1980, Empire of the Way of Life was, was a bridge, that book, his last book was bridged in the nation and distributed to the uh, delegates of the Democratic Convention in 1980 which were here, which was housed here in New York, was meant to strengthen the anti-imperial wing, the waning of the wing of the Democratic Party that united around Andrew Kennedy. Um, 
but you know, just to have a kind of intellectual doing the work that 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 um, that Williams was doing for the nation and in his books today would be just to, just to get a sense was was um, somebody who could fluidly combine diplomatic history, uh, attention to large scale social transformation, and ideology critique. Would be like combining, you know, uh, Andrew Basovitz, Eric Hobsbawm, and Slavo Zizek you know, <laughs> into one person. And, and the nation gave him a tribute, gave him a, gave him a platform. And it wasn't just Williams. And I'll end with this point: it was the people that the Williams trained that went on to write for the nation. That, that some of the people. You know, talked about you know the name the roster is quite impressive you know Richard Vaughn and uh, Akbal Ahmed Sal Landa who also just passed away recently uh, Lloyd Gaughan the doll operator Paul Buell Marilyn Young Gabriel Colco Marcus Raskin the names go on and on in the, the influence either directly or indirectly of Williams's critique of empire which which, um, which, which I'll just end there and, uh, yeah. <coughs>